Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our illuminating content. Here is episode 176. You know, like these sort of ways that we navigate from day to day that there's no way if we keep it in the same school system, there's no way we're going to get to a point where we can understand each other and everybody can feel free and empowered. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the luminous mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Akila Richards. Akila is a published author, digital content writer, and a self-directed education advocate who writes passionately about self-expression, womanhood, modern feminism, location, independence, and homeschooling lifestyle. She's a storyteller who believes in the power of express personal narrative and deep self-acceptance as tools of authentic self-expression and community enrichment. She produces podcasts, books, classes, and articles on radical self-expression in practice and in study. Her online home is Akila S. Richards.com, where she works to support, connect, and highlight people of color designing their own liberation through self-directed education and love-centered community building. Welcome, Akila. Thank you, Rebecca. Very, very, very happy to be here with you. Uh, I'm so excited to have you here. Um, looking over her work, listening to her podcast, it is going to be so exciting talking to Akila about her passions. However, before we get into any of that, please tell our audience a little bit more about yourself. Um, Rebecca and I were talking about this before we started recording, like there's so many pieces. <laughs> so it's always good to just tell the overall story. So I am an entrepreneur, primarily a writer, a digital content writer. I also write my own books, do some ghost writing for some other folks. And I really just work around finding spaces to talk to people who care about the things I write about. That's awesome. <laughs> and mostly, yeah, and mostly I write about something that I call radical self-expression, which is a term I thought I made up, but then I heard it on um what was it? Burning Man. Something I saw something about Burning Man and one of their tenets is radical self-expression. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with that that festival, Burning Man, but that's one of their principles. And um, so for me, radical self-expression is about exploring and expressing your authentic self, you know, really trying to de-school yourself in a sense from the circumstances that created all of these pain points and barriers to your authenticity and just really learning how to navigate that space. And um over time, I was working on that for myself <laughs> and then also with other new moms. And I'd written a book about it as a newer mom. And then I got into blogging and uh, then focused more on writing. And then over time, uh, as my girls got older and became school aged, we really shifted into how to create these same sort of tools for authentic self-expression in our daughters as well. We have two daughters. And then it, we realized that school was not only not conducive to that, but it was actually a major barrier to that. And so we started unschooling and it really has become just this mindfulness practice that is really rooted in my own work around radical self-expression. Well, and if you read her about page, um, I think you do a really great job of kind of giving us your basically your journey of what, you know, led you to discover what you love to do. Let's kind of do you want to talk about that a little bit more in depth? Maybe, yeah. How you found that passion and mission? Sure, sure. So I was getting ready to go to law school, right? I'd finished college and a couple of years after college, I was working as a file clerk at one of Atlanta's largest law firms and, you know, had my head on straight and I was really focused <laughs> doing the things you're supposed to do. And then, um, when I became pregnant with our first daughter, and I always give the disclaimer that it's going to sound crazy to some people, but it's just what happened. I was starting to hear her ask me questions. <laughs> like she was, she was asking me about being herself. Like, and it wasn't, I termed it in one of the books, like she was asking me about being herself for a living or if she could grow up to be herself. But it wasn't that uh, direct of a question. It was just these different feelings and ideas and voices around 
just showing up authentically and that it, whether I was doing it or not, and if I wasn't doing it, then could I now bring this human being into a world where she felt like this was possible for her too? So that started me on the journey. And after we had Marley, then I realized for sure that I was not going to go to law school. So that dream and that focus I'd had for all that time, I was finally strong enough to put that away and not need to replace it with anything else right away. And so that's what got me into writing. And that's something that I'd always wanted to do. I'd always considered myself a writer, but you can't be a writer for a living. You have to do great stuff and then write. And that's how it was in my mind. So I started focusing back on writing and dabbling in some other things that were of interest and trying to make money on the side. And I also started blogging. And then eventually I became the amusing air quotes mom blogger, you know, where I was blogging and had sponsors on my side and I was doing like events with Disney and all of these different places and just really going down that road and, and just writing more and more about discovery with my daughters and myself. And then women started asking me about advice more often. And then in 2009, uh, and Marley was born in 2004, in 2009, I was featured in Essence magazine. And then I was like, oh, okay, so people are paying attention and stuff. Maybe I should have a really professional website. Um, and maybe <laughs> I could like work with more women around this stuff. And my, my husband's a, a web guy, branding guy, marketing guy. So he put together a really nice sort of like digital platform for me for going from my blog into this space. And then I started coaching with women and realizing that a lot of the issues they had were around the work they did, how they spent their time. So then I started working with women on entrepreneurship and spirituality and the connection between those two things and wrote more books and did a couple of retreats around that work and um, workshops and summits, really dove into that work. And then um, just the more my girls grew, the more I just started realizing, again, that connection between my stuff and and um, the limitations that it posed on them. And then it, and then school happened and the whole thing with Marley being labeled as gifted and being tested repeatedly. Then Sage, my youngest, the same thing happened with her. So after a while, we realized that school wasn't feeding the whole person. It could only focus on academics, even though they had wonderful teachers whom we loved very much. It just couldn't be enough. And then it also we started realizing things like the whitewashing of the curricula, which we knew from school. You know, they didn't talk about aspects of other cultures until like Black History Month. You know, so all of these different things that we we went through them as children, but we were able to notice it far more keenly and in a broader context as parents. And so we acted upon that by removing our girls from that environment. And then we moved to Jamaica for like six weeks to just start exploring what life might look like without schooly stuff. And that we've just never gone back to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and I love the questions that you asked yourself. I think hopefully as a parent, we're all kind of asking ourselves that. But, you know, and especially when your girls entered school, when you talk about, you know, having gone through it yourself and then wanting to create, making sure that that was different, right? I mean, it was that right. part of like law school, you know, feeling like, well, this is what I've been told I have to do to be successful. And then, but it wasn't really a path. You know what I mean? Like you were exactly. living through somebody else's. Exactly. That's where, that's where that circumstance thing comes in, Rebecca. It's like, we're in these um, circumstances that we're calling relationships and goals, but they really are just a result of the circumstance we're in, what our parents prioritize because of their pain points and their fears or because of their successes. You know, this happens with us in a lot of different aspects from schooling to what we pursue as a vocation to our religious and spiritual beliefs, all of these different things that we really not until adulthood do we have the opportunity to be mindful about. And in some cases, we may still agree with the way that we were raised, which is awesome. But then there are many other times where not only do we disagree, but going along with that misalignment is it's costing us so much, including our relationships or lack of healthy relationships with the people around us, including our children and how we see them and all of that. Well, and it really is trying to connect everything that's been disconnected for us, you know, like with yes. school, a lot of it a lot of it's chopped up like you you can't blend your spiritual side with your ethnic background with all of those things and so that's yeah. 
yeah, a, quite a challenge. The little tiki tacky boxes, yeah, as they <laughs> say. And <laughs> so it's so hard to come out of that. As I know, you know, it's like de schooling is really a forever practice because there are all <laughs> of these spaces where you're like, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't feel good. And then there's the work, as I mentioned before, to not replace that one thing with another thing to really just be and let something organically emerge is a skill that we just are not really practiced in. Yeah. For us adults, it's gone through that the unschooling is so much harder. You know, it's it's definitely, I mean, something we have to practice and model for our own children. Well, give us an idea, you know, on her website, I just copied this little line out because I loved, you know, on her about page at the very end, she said to join me in working towards the liberation of people of color through radical self-expression and self-directed education. And that's what I hope to do a lot with Akila today is, you know, let's talk about how we can help liberate people of color. You know, I come from where I'm at, the ethnic It's growing. It's definitely growing more than what I had as a child. But, you know, the diversity of different people isn't very great. But I have noticed that, you know, in homeschooling, unschooling situations, there is no there is no I mean, it's all, you know, white, (laughs) unschooling, you know, whatever. So let's talk about that. What are some struggles that you've seen with that? And how can we help liberate people of color? Yeah. Well, the first thing is that I think people of color can only we can only liberate ourselves. So that's the the first thing. But I feel like in terms of being able to be together in communities where there is a willingness to understand and to accept and to not, you know, like even having this conversation, Rebecca, that so many people are afraid to have because it is uncomfortable and because a lot of times it's new and it's so deeply nuanced and it's personal. So it's very difficult. So being in spaces where people are willing to allow people to be who are willing to be uncomfortable and not need other people to like make them comfortable. That's how I feel like people who not people of color, basically white people can be a part of this movement, you know, because the movement is already happening. As you said, you rarely see people of color in the homeschooling, unschooling spaces, but we're there. <laughs> so the, so one of the main challenges is that feeling of isolation. It really feels like I remember when I appeared on TV in the unschooling context, it was the Steve Harvey show, which was, I think, last year, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I think and I saw that. Yeah. Yes, the one on unschooling. And it was like they, you know, they had it like an old school versus new school where they sort of like wanted to pit the two against each other. It was ridiculous. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to get on TV and act like a crazy person for your ratings. But (laughs) one of the things that came as a result of that is that so many people of color were messaging me, emailing me, direct messaging me on Twitter and Facebook and saying, oh, my God. So there is more. There, it isn't just me and the one other person that I know who's doing this. I cannot believe you've been around all this time. Then I'm meeting other people who have been on, even at like unschooling conferences, you know, people of color who I'm just hearing about. So the isolation makes it really hard to feel a sense of community because you get into a space and when you don't see anyone who looks like you and you don't have the connection of culture, you sort of feel like, you know, like one, there's the idea that you're always needing to explain yourself and your why and that people aren't comfortable with the things that you need. You know, so when we talk about I always give the example of world schooling because we do a bit of that when we're traveling, even if we decided to drive from one state to another, even though safety is safety is safety, everybody is nervous about crime. There are very specific parts of even America that my black family wouldn't feel safe driving through. And a white family may say, well, there are certain parts that my white family uh, wouldn't feel driving through, wouldn't feel comfortable driving through. But I'm talking about police officers pulling you over wherever you are. And I'm talking about what happens if you were to get into it as some sort of issue with someone whose side would the law be on? You know, who is safer? These sort of things that we don't necessarily recognize in our day to day. But then when they come up, we have to be around people who are willing to have these discussions or to let us have these discussions without feeling like they need to defend it. You you know, like my empowerment doesn't mean that I think you're less than, and we need to start getting clear about that. So yeah, yeah. So that's one of the, the, the reasons why that's so important to me, because I come across so many black and brown folks who say, man, in my city, 
I don't know any other people of color who are um, homeschooling, much less unschooling, or I want some alternatives because in the school, none of my kids' teachers are people of color, so they don't understand certain things or they view this as adversarial when we know it actually means this. You know, like these sort of ways that we navigate from day to day that there's no way if we keep it in the same school system there's no way we're going to get to a point where we can understand each other and everybody can feel free and empowered. Wow, you just said so much that I just agree with. I I think, you know, when you're talking about being on the Steve Harvey show and they're trying to pit each other against, I think that's our society. You know, we want to pit each other against each other with like yeah. to look at our differences instead of our strengths and to celebrate those, you know, together, you know, that, that you have something maybe I don't, but I think that's wonderful, you know, type of thing. Yes, so. exactly. Exactly. And, and that, and that we don't always have to like understanding doesn't mean that I agree with it or even that I get it, but I can respect it. I can appreciate it. I can not, I can release the need to fully understand it. You know, these are these are just some of the things where um, I say a lot that I don't feel like we have a lot of language or even practice around this this liberated way of being, because all of us are dealing with some sort of master. Right. And then some of us are dealing with multiple masters. And so we are trying to figure out how to be free amid all of these different forms of oppression. And that's really, really tough. Yeah. And they are they do need to be talked about. You know, I was recently listened to a podcast that, you know, some people dismiss the whole idea of you, know, you were talking about the safety and the police officers. But I mean, it's like there is studies that, you know, if you're a black male and you're driving a super nice car, I actually heard that Denzel Washington and some of those, they finally just went and bought a mediocre car because <laughs> they got pulled over twice as often. I mean, they just got tired of being pulled over and questioned about, you know, they would just right. be assumed that that had been stolen or something. Exactly, you know? exactly. And it's like, it doesn't matter what type of car you're in. And, you know, it's great to have these statistics so that other people can see it too. But we know these things because we have direct experience. I can tell you how many times I or my husband or one of my three brothers or whomever, you know, was pulled over because of how we looked, no matter what we were driving or because I have locks, you know, or because my skin is dark or because I have tattoos, like all of these different things <laughs> that that are connected to all these different aspects of self that our culture says, uh, you know, they equate it with something bad, you know, and now because of social media and technology, we get to see these things front and center, which I think um, because they've always been going on, mm -hmm. especially when we talk about this country, we know this country's history with people of color. We know about public lynchings. We know uh, statistically and from personal narratives who gets off or, or who's punished more harshly. These are some of the reasons why, for me, school is the opposite of that liberatory space. Because I heard um, there's this woman, her name is Becca Korwitz, and she has a she actually opened recently an agile learning center in Oaxaca in Mexico, and she is Swedish. And she opened this place in Oaxaca and she was talking about, we did a, a show together for the love of learning, Lainey Liberty show. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. If you, That's awesome. Yes, yeah. yes. I love Lainey. She was talking about, Lainey asked her the question about school. How do you feel about school? And she said, I'm against it. And I remember being like, Oh, <laughs> what? you know, this was like, even maybe like three years ago, maybe less. And so I was still like, no, come on guys, we can have reform and it can work <laughs> and that sort of thing, you know? And I, even though, as we were talking about before, I can totally get where someone is coming from who feels like that because people say, well, everybody won't be able to homeschool or unschool. So we have to fix the larger system. And now having done so much research and connected with so many people, Rebecca, I'm with Becca Korwitz. I, it just one of the main reasons why school can't work is because it is very much a microcosm of all those same things we just talked about. Yeah. You know, things like the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, we things talked like about the, that. Yeah, yeah. Things like the way, you know, the punishments, the harsher punishments, what happens with charter schools even, which are really public schools, you know, with that privatization component, how they go into neighborhoods of color and allow corporations to come in and basically pull from funding that really doesn't benefit the students. Like there's so many aspects. Black girls are highly sexualized in school settings and made to, you know, treat it as if they are older in certain ways. There are all of these facts and experiences that if we were able to look at learning outside of that, 
and to bring learning more into a space of community, then all people, including people of color, can be more connected to the community. We can solve things together. We can work together to innovate and pivot and, you know, really do things that are serving what's happening now in the world instead of trying to maintain this structure that really was very much, it didn't include us in yeah. particular. And as you said, it's designed to pit us against each other to compete. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Changing a paradigm takes some study, but like me, you are probably super busy. That's why we've teamed up with Audible. Go to our website, theluminousvine.net, get a free month of Audible with two audiobooks, thousands of titles in exchange for only books that you absolutely love. You too can be learning on the go to keep that fire burning. Welcome back to the Luminous Minds with Akila Richards, working towards the liberation of people of color through self-directed education. My mind is on fire with what you're saying because I, I totally can see how instead of trying to restore or instead of trying to, you know, reconstruct the system and make it something that's better, it actually, we just need to throw it out and really start all the way over, you know? Yeah. Let's kind of talk about maybe some of the challenges you've had with your message. Um, you were specific on, you know, some of the the challenges that education looks like for specifically for people of color. Do you want to talk maybe a little bit more about that? And how can we get more parents to think of this self-directed education and unschooling a little bit more seriously? Yeah, for sure. And I um, I will send you some links because I've written extensively about this sort of thing that a lot of the issues that we face are some of the ones that I've mentioned before and the implications of that in our um, homes. You know, when you know that you are three times more likely or four times, I think, statistically now to be arrested as a black male when you are 13 percent of the U.S. population. We think about this and I laugh and it's one of those like nervous, scary laughters where I don't, you know, even saying it out loud sounds like it sounds unreal, but it is very real. So these sort of things affect our homes. And so they affect our ability to embrace learning in these environments that say it needs to look like this one thing. So for folks who are listening and who feel like, you know, any of this resonates and you want to be part of the solution, the first thing I would say is for those of us who are already immersed in self-directed education in any form, whether it's unschooling or a learning co-op or sometimes schooling, people do that where their kids are kind of in when they need a particular thing and out when they don't. I think all of it is great. The first thing is to share the story. Those personal narratives are really, really important. And you share it however you're comfortable. For some of us, depending on what states we're in, if we're in the, you know, the states like Pennsylvania, where the laws are really, really strict around educating your kids, then I get it. You know, maybe you're sharing the story. What's the term? Not autonomously, anonymously. <laughs> maybe you're sharing anonymously, you know, guest writing in other spaces. But share the stories. We we need to know what's going on so that people, what it does is it gives other people permission to share their stories as well. And then it also allows for a sense of connectedness so that you don't feel like you're going through it alone. The other thing is to get local. You know, find out, go on meetup.com or go on Twitter and Instagram and, and use the hashtag of your city to see what other people are doing in the space. That's one of the reasons why I have this podcast, Fear of the Free Child, because I wanted to I wanted to make it both bigger and smaller, self-directed education. I wanted to make it bigger in terms of diversifying the narrative. Of, as you mentioned, Rebecca, when you type it, when you look it up on Google or wherever, you're only going to see white people. Like very rarely are you going to see, you know, a Latinx person or an Asian person or a black person. So diversifying the narrative is, is going to be really helpful. And then look at what's going on locally in your community. Oftentimes the libraries, oftentimes homeschooling co-ops register at libraries or they do things at libraries. Get involved, you know, because we we really need to get more comfortable with designing 
spaces where learning happens, where, where learning can thrive, I should say, because it happens everywhere. We really need to do that. And when we do that, then design organically emerges. You said, you know, kids self-organize. They, they know what they're, they're interested in. They are very versed at finding ways to get to resources. And our job is to help them with that. So that's what I think, telling the stories, finding out who's doing it around you locally. These are some of the ways that we can break out of the other story. You know, the idea that the, the one single narrative that if you don't go to school and go to college, then for a black kid, that means your kid is going to become prisoner 92586 because of things like respectability politics, where we think we have to look, you know, the least African, the less African we look, the safer we look in white America. So where, you know, dress up more, perm your hair um, if you're black, you know, process your hair or don't lock it. You know, don't do all of these things that make you threatening. We, we feel like those are the answer. And so school pushes that. And for people of color in particular, you know, even in this country, Rebecca, we, we know that there's been such a struggle for us to have equality in education. Yeah. Right. You know, Brown versus the versus the Board of Education, even with the you know, when we with desegregation, we know that that still meant subpar schools um, in many instances and subpar schooling. So for people of color, it's particularly hard, Rebecca, because we feel like particularly in America, we fought so hard and now we owe it you know, to our children to make sure that they can excel in the school system and achieve the American dream. But what we fail to realize is that American dream is a facade and that the school system is really, through my lens, another version of a plantation that pushes out this worker type who is going to be undervalued, still targeted in the same way. They might live in a nicer house, but they're not dealing with any of the issues and they're certainly not solving it by making a few more dollars, you know, especially if that sense of self isn't there. So we have to these are some of the reasons why I think it's directly connected to our liberation. If we learn how to live together and to become producers more and consumers less and to work collectively instead of competitively, these sort of things. This is a question that I didn't necessarily have on my list that I sent to you. But if you don't live in a zip code that has a decent school and then like we talked about, even if you do, you know, you may be pitted. Is there do you think that it's possible that maybe if you live in a lower end situation and do you still think it's possible to to create a self-directed education. I think this is this is a topic I remember discussing because I used to be really involved in the school choice and people were like, well, look yeah. at the inner cities. They could never homeschool or they could never do this because they just don't have the education to do that. You know, right. Do you yeah. feel like, I mean, I know that that's not true because you see them even in a charter school, once they're given a choice, these parents do care about their kids. I mean, do you feel like that it's possible, even though they may not have that education? Of course it's possible because we have to back up and talk about what education is. What do we mean by that? When, when people say that, they're not actually talking about someone having the capacity to help their child to thrive in education. What they're talking about is paperwork. What they're talking about sometimes is also availability, right? Because to be practical, if both parents are working, mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's jobs where it's long hours and little pay, you know, waitressing jobs, uh, you know, s these different sort of service industry jobs. Of course, in that one setting, it can't look like what it would look like for Chris and me who are self-employed and working from home. But there it is again, this idea of trying to replace one master for another. We're not saying how can we mirror aspects of schooling at home? We're saying, how can we facilitate learning? So what this reminds me of, Rebecca, is when we go back to the idea of like missionaries and even abolitionists going into communities and saving the children and saving the families by deciding, Pulling you know, what I, <laughs> yes. And then also deciding what they should and shouldn't speak. So you can't speak your native language. You can't dress this way because we know what works and here's what it is. And we know with the indigenous people, it, you know, it was tragic, tragic, you know, the type of things that have happened. Same thing with, with Black folks. So the first thing is that I know for a fact that there are communities of color and also impoverished communities that include different people of different racial backgrounds who get together to create learning spaces because learning happens organically. So for example, if you are in walking distance of a library or even today community centers where you can have books brought over, things of that nature, or with uh, the virtual tools that we have access to, 
young children are still able to get online and pull resources and connect with each other um, to get things done. And if they're doing that, then the adults in that space, what they need to do is make sure Wi-Fi is available. And there are many ways to do that, um, to look at safety aspects, to help kids manage conflict. These aren't things that require an advanced degree. <laughs> yeah, pretty much comes down to maybe trying to adjust your schedules so that somebody's just there to make sure they're safe, right? Yes. And and are also collaborating because you don't even maybe your input or your effort is not with scheduling. Maybe you can't adjust your schedule, but maybe while you're at work, especially if sometimes you sit at a desk or you have an extended break, then you can be sending resources to the main list that says, oh, I found this book here that I think would be great for the kids who are interested in that. Or a guy came into the restaurant that I work at that does uh, blacksmithing and I got his card and it would be great because maybe we can have a blacksmithing day because we have a couple of kids who are interested in that or we want to strew and we got these books. So there are many ways that it can look. We don't need to dis- design that in advance. We just need to have that collective goal of facilitating learning and listening to the kids in our community, seeing what they want, and then tapping into the resources around us to do that. And you don't have to be upper middle class to do that. And you don't have to be white to do that. And you don't have to be rich to do that. Awesome. I love that. (laughs) Well, let's talk a little bit. We talked a little bit about how you have a podcast and you've done some speaking and writing. You've been on different shows. You know, how do you feel like your message is being received? Really well, actually. It, it's funny when I um before I transitioned into to writing primarily around self-directed education, I consider myself an intersectional feminist and I was writing a lot as I was discovering. And this is what I do. I learn out loud, like unapologetically. I learn out loud. And so I'm always like writing about it or I might create a course once I've really spent a couple of years immersed in something. And when I was writing about feminism, That's when I got people (laughs) who were just really, really, really angry at me for very different reasons. But now, of course, every once in a while, I get the person who says either this is ridiculous. Kids need a proper education and what you're doing is actually neglect. That's what I get typically or sometimes within my own communities of color. That same thing I, I talked about before where it's like, no, our people fought too hard for you to be telling somebody to pull their kid out of school, you know that a a child of color is not going to have the same sort of privilege to be able to walk into a space and say, oh, I don't have a college degree, but blah, blah, blah. Whereas a a white male would, for example, you know, so those are some of the things that I, if you want to call it backlash that I get, but I really, really try to focus on the people who are either curious about it or already immersed in it, you know, or in some part of the journey, that's who my work is for. So I can't change your mind, but I feel like if I create enough support and community and action around the folks who are doing it, then they're going to be able to pollinate their circles with that because you're going to see that, oh my God, the kid isn't stupid or, oh my God, they didn't die because they don't know, uh, you know, whatever level of calculus you thought they should know by now, or, oh my God, they can't read, but here are these other amazing things that they can do. You know, the more we see that, the more we create language and experience for that, the less I think we'll fight other people because we know the school system is broken. Yeah. People just trust that. Sometimes yeah. I'm, I want to shake them like it's it could be worse sending them there, <laughs> not better. You know, right, right. <laughs> but but like you said, I love the idea of just changing your own circle that you have within yourself and, uh, you know, around you and then yeah. to also accept different people, you know, to be welcoming to those to the people that come in to yeah. that society. Well, and give us a little bit of idea of maybe some personal habits that you feel like you have that have been really helpful to this new becoming that you've came, <laughs> come to. Yeah, uh, becoming for real emphasis on that suffix like ing because it's, <laughs> it's definitely <still> going. <laughs> yes, it's a practice. It's a forever practice. I think the mindfulness component, Rebecca, is one of the major, major things that are just so juicy and good in my life. Like, I feel like there's this fog or this sort of like, I don't know, alarm system that I've been operating off of just kind of going with, with, again, the circumstance, you know, my circumstantial self, if you will, and being able to, to understand observation as both a surrender and also a very active thing has been really useful for me in even organizing my day 
in trusting myself as an entrepreneur, in trusting my children, you know, in understanding even my own self and my own triggers. So, uh, for example, I used to um, have a lot of guilt around not being an early riser because the early bird gets the worm. And, you know, (laughs) all of that. I'm sure you're familiar with the eight bazillion cliches that tell you you're a bad, broken person if you don't try to get up at six o'clock or four like Michelle Obama to work out before the sun is up or whatever. (laughs) But I'm just not like that. I'm not like that. And, And it might seem like a minor thing, but personal leadership, I think, is at the core of a lot of pain for us. You know, we don't know how to lead ourselves because we've never been trusted with ourselves. So I'm learning how to how to trust myself. And one of the ways that I do that is by as often as I can. It's not every day, but I rise to my my own clock. I get up when I'm ready to get up and I take maybe 45 minutes before I actually even step out of the bed because I want to do my meditation and I want to jot down my notes in Evernote and, you know, all of these different things. So being able to do those sort of things now help me to manage my anxiety. They help me to work with clients that maybe I wouldn't work with before because I was viewing them through a different lens. But even though that was my stuff that was unresolved, it shows me that I can say no to things and be okay with it. So if I'm working on something, even saying no to myself, if I decided today that what I'm going to work on is this, and then my daughters come in and they're really immersed in something else and they want me involved in that space no one's going to die. I can put that aside and I can either choose to stay up late or I can make a few phone calls. And so, you know, just things like that before where it was like, oh my God, what's going to happen? <laughs> it, it allows me now to be like, Akila, breathe, calm down. What about this? J- just that thing that might sound so simple has made a world of difference for me. Yeah. I don't know where we got to this point where we couldn't trust ourselves, you know. I mean, mindfulness is just something that I'm starting to practice now. And I mean, yeah. even to the point of like, you know, I felt like a bad mom if I didn't clean my own house. <laughs> yes. But yet it was just bugging me. And I'm like, you know what, it's okay if I let somebody come in and help me here, because I would rather be doing this, you know, and, exactly. and really discovering, you know, trying to get rid of those false notions that we have and really discovering what what makes me tick and makes me happy or what makes me angry or what, you know, I don't know, maybe we always thought we were being selfish by doing that. But. I think so. And I, I think also, again, because we weren't we weren't practiced with it in school, for example, which most of us go through, the, the validation is very much external. It's not you, you didn't do well because you felt well. You did well because they said you did, yeah. you know, no matter how you were feeling. So if you got a C, but you felt like you did really the best you could, you got a C. A C says you barely tried. And that's what it means. And so that sort of conditioning, of course, is going to be something that we put our own, we're going to put everything through that filter. So we don't have enough practice being able to check in with ourselves and say, you know, what do I need in this moment? And and what are these feelings that I'm having around it? And these things sound so sort of like woo woo and, yeah. and highly personal. And what does it have to do with the practicality of the world? Well, everything, because hurt people hurt people. We know yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, again, it views how you see other people. It views whether you operate from a fair based space or a space of confident autonomy and love. You know, it uh, affects your ability to work with other people. All of these things are, are, are part of these life skills that we put aside in favor of the more intellectual components, you know, the the hard skills, as we call them, as opposed to the soft skills. But we're suffering as a result of that, because we make all this money, or we have all these things on the checklist, but we're not happy. We know what depression, we know what mental illness, you know, all of these different things that are, there are multiple reasons for them. But a big part of them is because we don't, we don't know who we are. And, and we're afraid of, of what that lack of knowledge means when we step out into the world. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, give us an idea of maybe what your future looks like. You know, do you have any long term goals and, and how does that work into the legacy that you hope to leave? Books. You know, I'm a writer first and foremost, Rebecca. All this other stuff is really just like in between writing, <laughs> you know, and ways to like monetize things outside of writing. But um, certainly more books. I want to collaborate with some folks on some books. I really want, I have this thing in my head of 77 books. I was born in 1977. And I have this idea of um, writing 77 books before my 77th birthday. And I have eight down 
<laughs> so I have quite a bit to go. And then also we plan on going to Africa, going over to the mother continent for the first time this year. So that's pretty exciting. We're really excited about spending some time starting out in South Africa, most likely, and then venturing um, over and on up into West Africa, where we have some friends and family. Um, so really excited about that. I'm, I'm also doing a lot of work around the building out the community of the podcast. The podcast has really, thankfully, already 20 episodes in really forming into a community. So I started a Slack group for people of color in self-directed education and anyone in support of that. And so really just trying to create more space for dialogue to happen where I'm not in, I'm not the liaison, you know, <laughs> I just want to be like one of the people in the group too. Like if we're building in something in Charlotte, let me know when to show up. You know, I don't want to organize it, but if we're building something in, you know, Kingston, and I happen to be in Kingston, then I can organize it, you know, that sort of thing, just kind of opening up the space a lot more. Um, of course, as you may know, I'm, I'm working with the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, which I'm super, super excited about that. Well, and have uh, you we, done some of the voiceovers for the videos? Yeah, yeah. I did. I did one. And I, there are a couple coming up with where my daughter, I want to say one of them is out where my daughter Marley, who is um, one of her interests is voice acting. So she's done a couple of those. And um, we're actually working on a, a book together too, the four of us, myself uh, and Chris and our girls. Yeah, those are some of the, the things that are coming up that I'm really excited about. <laughs> I'm excited about them too. I'm excited to see, <laughs> see where you go. That sounds awesome. Well, and before we say goodbye, I mean, we've talked almost an hour, but before we say goodbye, <laughs> Do you have any maybe final parting words for our listeners? And then give us your contact information of how we can get all your books and writings. And she's got some awesome classes, too. I'm like, I'm taking that one. <laughs> so tell us more about that. Yeah, thank you. I don't nothing. Nothing is rising to the top as any final word. I'm, I'm always grateful. I think gratitude is always a, a good um, end point. I'm, I'm grateful for the space you're creating here. Of course, I was binge listening to some of the episodes over the past week <laughs> and really enjoying them, Rebecca. So I would just say gratitude. You know, I feel like um, in addition to mindfulness, being able to see how innately brilliant children are really keeps me in a space of gratitude. And because of that, then over time, I'm, I'm less and less anxious about what they're doing and not doing. So it's helping me to develop a much healthier relationship with my girls. And I know any parent, even if you're not a mother or a father, even if you're just a part of a parenting village, I know that we want to have healthy relationships where the young people trust us and trust themselves. And so I would say, you know, being in gratitude for the things you see in them already and, and trying to look at the ways that you may be participating in their oppression I write and speak a lot around that. So yeah, that's that's basically it. Just look at some of the things that you can stop judging and start being more in gratitude for. And that really opens you up to a lot of things. If you want to develop maybe a little bit of a deeper, not necessarily understanding, maybe exploration around that, AkilaSRichards.com. I'm over on Medium where I do a lot of my writing. It's medium.com forward slash radical selfie, all one word. And then my, when you go to AkilaSRichards.com, that's where you'll have access to my classes that not, they're not all unschooling focused, but they are very much about self-expression and mindfulness and, you know, just really starting to be more active about love and liberation. Well, and I really love what you were talking about with um, watching your children and being grateful for them, because I feel like that's a discovery of mindfulness, too. And we can watch our children and how naturally that learning comes. Yes. Then all of a sudden we can go, oh, well, that's the way it should be for me. You know? <laughs> Man, yeah. you know how many essays, Rebecca, <laughs> I have that started out with me just watching them do something. And it's just like, I could not have gotten this in all of my college classes put together, this lesson that I'm getting here. It, it's just, it's really, really powerful. And it's not always my kids either. It's other people's kids too. It's just, I'm really grateful. And I, and I love that I'm in a, a day and time where there are other people that I can connect with who are learning how to trust themselves and their children too. I, I think we're changing the freaking future. Yeah, like yeah. I really do. Talk yeah. about community and connection. You know, it's exactly. definitely go back to that instead of pity. Exactly, Rebecca. Awesome. Yes. 
Well, great. <laughs> Once again, her website is AkilaSRichards.com. However, we're going to be sure to link all the information that we've discussed today, including maybe some of the articles and different things that we mentioned on our website as well. But thank you so much, Akila, for coming on and joining us and helping light our minds on fire. I so appreciate it. You are very welcome. And as I said, I appreciate you making space for me too, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Akila Richards, go to our show notes, theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our email list. Then check out the services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of illuminating content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us. Leave us a review. Share our content. Tell us how we can help you. So together, we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education 